Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you're watching us from, I want to welcome you back to the School of the Word. We trust that um, if you've um, viewed the last two videos, you have that basis and understanding of what the School of the Word is all about and what type of courses we are covering. If joining us today for the first time, welcome. And I encourage you to go back and check the other two videos, the previous videos, so that you can have that uh, background to what we are discussing in the School of the Word. But before we proceed further, let's just pause in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. But once again, you brought us to this place where we can be able to just spend time having an understanding of your word. As we look at your word in the Old Testament, we ask you to give us understanding and give us insight. And let the things that we're going to study, Lord, help us as we get into your word. In Jesus' mighty name we do pray and ask. Amen. Amen. So let's just do a bit of a review on what we covered in the last session. In our last session, we did an overview of the Old Testament. One key thing we emphasize is that the, the story of the Old Testament is not told in a vacuum. It has a context. It has a background. The Old Testament is set within an area. That area is normally known as the ancient Near East and sometimes referred to as the Fertile Crescent. We call it the Middle East. Why was it called the ancient? Why is it called the Fertile Crescent? It was the, it, it, the area around, that's where you had the two most fertile areas of the region. On one side, you had Egypt and the now Delta, very fertile. On the other side, you had Mesopotamia, which basically is the land between two rivers, the two rivers being the river Euphrates and the Tigris River. Surrounding that whole area we've seen in the maps, you have a number of major seas. You have the Black Sea, you have the Caspian Sea, you have the Persian Gulf, you have the Mediterranean Sea, you have the Red Sea. You have a lot of mountain ranges in that area as well. You have the Zagros Mountains, the Taurus Mountains, you have the Caucasus Mountains. So that whole area, you have black basalt rocks in the area as well. You have got deserts. You have the Sahara Desert, the Sinai Desert, the Arabian Desert. That's the kind of the geography of the world within which the Old Testament finds its expression. This morning, we are going to look at the world of the Old Testament. It's important for us to understand that world as well. Like we said previously, it's a course in Old Testament studies designed to introduce you to the Old Testament as God's Word. And we believe that as you join us on this journey, your life will be greatly enriched as you study the Old Testament. To fully appreciate the message of the Old Testament, to fully appreciate what God is saying in the Old Testament, we need to take time to learn about the world of the Old Testament. We need to gather as much as we can in terms of knowledge about the world of the Old Testament. We need to understand its culture. We need to understand its geography, its history, the languages of the place, the regions, the religions that were in that area, the ideologies, and take some time to read upon the archaeology of the area. Because once you begin to get into these studies of the area of the Old Testament, 
you're going to be able to appreciate much better what you're going to read in the Old Testament. As usual, I'll begin with a quotation. It says, The eternally significant and divinely authoritative message of the Old Testament originated with God and was imparted to Israel in order to impact God's servant nation, that's Israel, as well as all the surrounding nations. So the message of the Old Testament was not given by man. It's important for us to understand that. Important for us to realize that the message of the Old Testament, that eternal message, that divinely inspired message of the Old Testament actually has its origin with God. God is the one that gave that message to the nation of Israel, to the children of Israel. So that through that nation, God can be able to impact the nation itself and the people themselves and all those surrounding them. That's, that's, that's heavy. So that's, that's, that's exactly what happened. But let me do a disclaimer here. Background studies do not interpret the scripture. They don't interpret the Bible. These background studies that we are doing are just there to give us an understanding to the text of the Old Testament. The background studies I exist to help us to be able to reconstruct the behavior, the beliefs, the culture, the values, the worldview of the people of the Old Testament. So it's critical to understand that these background studies are not going to help us interpret the Bible. They are going to give us background information that will make it a bit easier for us to understand the teaching of the Old Testament. Let's look at our Old Testament. As modern readers, we can easily relate and understand a book that's written in our time and in our culture. We can generally relate to most of the expressions that are used in that book. If there are institutions that are mentioned, institutions mentioned, we'll be able to relate to them. If there are any ideologies expressed, we'll be able to relate to such ideologies. I remember when I was doing missions in Botswana, I had a lot of friends from Cameroon, from Nigeria, a lot of friends from West Africa, West African countries. There's one phrase that they liked, especially the guys from Cameroon, used quite often, that at the beginning did not make sense to me. You'd find a guy, a friend says, or introduces to me, says, this is my junior brother, or this is my senior brother. At first, it did not make sense to me. Because it's a phrase, an expression that I'm not familiar with. We don't use junior brother and senior brother in the southern region. Later on, I came to understand that junior brother actually is a reference to my young brother. And senior brother is a reference to my Elder brother. Those are the expressions I'm used to. Young brother, elder brother. But in Cameroon, they say junior brother and senior brother. So those expressions are known to them, but they are not known to us this side. Similarly, we've got expressions that we use this side that people in the other areas may not be able to understand. Why am I saying this? The Old Testament, like we said in the previous session, is a collection of books. 39 books in all that were written over a period of 1,000 years. From about 1,400 BC up to about 400 BC. Now, you already see the dates. 
1,400 before Christ to 400 before Christ. So these are books that were written way before even our time. So naturally, they may seem to be out of place in our modern world. Because in these books, we are going to find, or we're going to be introduced to things that we are not familiar with. For instance, we know many things about God. But who is that? I'm sure all of us know what it means to brush our teeth. But has anyone ever washed your feet after you entered their home? Imagine, you go visit a brother after church and then you arrive at their home and the first thing is they greet you by the door, give you a small stool by the door, they start taking off your shoes, taking off your socks, they come with a basin and water and they start washing your feet. Excuse me? It's a custom, it's a culture that we will not be able to understand because we don't wash feet in our modern time, in this area where we are, or in many other areas around the world. But that was a daily lifestyle in their day. And many places in the Old Testament are going to come across such a practice. Even in the whole Bible, you're going to come across such a practice where people's feet were washed. In fact, if you remember the story of Jesus in the book of John, the Bible says he took upon himself a garment, he put the towel around his waist, and he washed the feet of his disciples. We don't do those things, but that is something that is done or was done in the Bible times and in the world of the Old Testament and in the New Testament. That's a process of day that we don't, we're not familiar with. I'm sure all of us see dogs and cats almost every day. But what are Leviathans? What are they? Leviathans, what are they? I'm sure you've heard of um, Roman Catholics and Protestants. You've heard of Baptists. You've heard of evangelicals. You've heard of um, Presbyterians. You've heard of, uh, using a South African term, Bazalwana. And you've met many people who call themselves priests. But what are Pharisees, zealots, sicaries? What are those? Those are terms we are not familiar with. That's why it's important for us to be able to sit together, get your Bible, sit down, join us as you go through this introductory study of the Old Testament. What is an introductory study? It's basically a preliminary study of the Old Testament. The purpose of this study is to lead you as a believer from a position where you are outside the Old Testament to a place where you can come inside the Old Testament. The aim of this study is to introduce you as a modern-day believer to the Old Testament, such that you're going to feel at home with the Old Testament and you come to be on friendly terms with it and begin to study it. So the focus of these introductory studies of the Old Testament is to familiarize you and to give you understanding of the Old Testament and not so much to evaluate what it says. Because there are quite a few things that are in the Old Testament that we are going to cover later on where we're going to evaluate certain things. Just to give you an example, one example, when Israel left um, Egypt, the Bible says they went to Mount Sinai. Where is Mount Sinai? If you go to Google and, print and type in 
the search engine Mount Sinai, it will point you to a place in Egypt. But is that really the Mount Sinai of the Bible? Think about it. God said they must leave the land. But if they're going to stay within the land, in Egypt, in Mount Sinai, it was not going to be easier for Pharaoh to take them back into slavery? Because Mount Sinai, there was a society living there. There were Egyptians living in that area. So how did um, Egypt, the Egyptian version of Mount Sinai come into place? It was established by one of the popes of the day, one of the leaders of the Catholic, of the Romans in the day, a guy called Justinian. That's the one that decided to say, that's where Mount Sinai is going to be, and they built a monastery in the area. It's known as St. Catherine's Monastery. That's where the whole saga of Mount Sinai in Egypt comes from. But is that to really be Mount Sinai of the Bible? No, it isn't. There's another Mount Sinai. But anyway, that's not for this series of studies. We'll do that later when we do some evaluations of some of these things. Let's do some important facts about the Old Testament. One thing we all understand is that the final revelation of God is in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the full expression of God's revelation is placed. However, we need to understand how we got there. How did we get to Jesus Christ? That story begins in the Old Testament, right from the book of Genesis. That's where the story begins. We can't fully understand the prophecies of Matthew. We can't understand the epistles of Paul. We can't understand the high priesthood of the exalted Christ as revealed in the book of Hebrews without a proper understanding and knowledge of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have a lot of quotations, a lot of illustrations, a lot of images that can only be properly understood if understood within the context of the Old Testament. So it's important for us to take time to study and into, to study the Old Testament. Did you know that 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, which says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for rebuke, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Written by Paul, was actually a reference to the Old Testament? Because that time, there was no New Testament. They didn't have a New Testament. So when Paul says all scriptures given by the of God, is actually referring to the Old Testament. And later on, when New Testament was developed and fully completed, it became part of Old Scripture. Now when it says Old Scripture, it includes both Old and New Testament. But initially, it was a reference to the Old Testament. Did you know that when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, leading 3,000 people to a knowledge of Christ, he actually used the Old Testament? He quoted from the book of Joel? Did you know that when the Lord Jesus Christ was being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. If you are the son of God, jump off this temple, the, the, the steeple of the temple. The angels are going to catch you. You won't even hit your foot against a stone. If you are the son of God, bow down and worship me. All these times when Satan was tempting our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord responded to Satan by saying, it is written. Three times the Lord said, it is written. Did you know that he was actually quoting from the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy? Did you know that when the Bible says, when John introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, 
Did you know that you can't understand what that really means unless you have an understanding of the sacrificial system? And that sacrificial system is found in the Old Testament? So do you, do you see, we really need to take some time to understand the Old Testament. Let's look at the world of the Old Testament. We saw the geography in the previous um, session. We said the, old, the different mountains, Zagros, the Taurus, the Caucasus mountains. We saw the seas, Black Sea, Caspian Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. We saw the desert, Sahara, Sinai, Arabia, as the world, the geographical world of the Old Testament. But what type of world was the Old Testament world? Firstly, it was, it's, a, it's actually a historical world. Like I said in the previous session, the story was not written in a vacuum. It has a context. There's a history associated with the region where the Old Testament finds expression. It's a historical world. The world actually existed. There was a place called Babylon. It has a new name today. There was actually a place called Nineveh, to which Jonah went. It exists today. There was a place known as Susa, where Esther's book has, is composed in that area. So the, the, that whole region actually existed. It's a historical place. It's a historical volume. It's a place full of history. Many people today study that history. Many people today quali get qualifications in that area. Nebuchadnezzar was a real person. King Cyrus and Darius the Mede were real people. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were real people. So there is, it's, it's a real world. It was the real world. It's historical. It's seen there. One of the greatest challenges that we had as a church was about the story of um, the Hittites. The Bible talks about the Hittites in the Old Testament. Many secular historians started pouring scorn on the story of the Bible and saying the Bible manufactured the Hittites because they could not be able to find them anywhere in history. It took a gentleman known as Hugo Winkler, researching in the area around modern-day Turkey, to begin to unearth the story of the Hittites. As archaeologists dug further, they've been able to unearth a whole library of Hittite documents and texts. Of course, not written on papers, not printed from our computers like we do in the modern day, but written on tablets of stone. That was the form of writing in the day. It's called cuneiform. They would do wedge-shaped um, signs in, in clay, bake it up. And those are stuff that they began to find. Actually, they even unearthed the capital city of the Hittites. Today, you can even go and specialize in Hittite studies. Get a qualification in Hittite studies. It's there. It exists today. It was a world it existed. In that world, there were real people. In that world, there were empires. A lot of empires. We all know about the sort of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. That's one of the empires that existed in that day. Those people had culture. They had their own cultures. 
Some of the things they practiced, of course, would be strange to us. And the children of God found themselves in the midst of a world that was actually very religious. The people in that world worshipped. They worshipped everything. They even worshippers of the moon god. Egypt worshipped elements, pantheon of gods. Different religious practices that were in that area. But let me just say something. Did you know that the plagues of Egypt were actually judgments from God on the gods of Egypt? Each one of those plagues had a, each one of those plagues had a god associated behind the plague. And God was hitting the gods of Egypt. So that's the kind of world that the children of Israel find themselves into. So it's important for us to understand the world of the Old Testament. If you're going to have a proper understanding of the Old Testament. I'm not expecting you to go and study Hebrew and Aramaic and Sumerian languages, and Akkadian languages. That's not what I'm asking you to do. Just have an understanding of what prevailed in the area. And thank God we have most of that stuff in English. We can be able to read it and understand it. So it's important to understand that we cannot really understand the Old Testament scriptures without viewing them against the background in which they are located. Understanding the geographical background, the historical background, and the cultural background in which they originated. Let's, let's, let's imagine. Let's do some imaginations. Think about it. We are told in the book of Genesis that Abram left his homeland in Ur of the, child, of the Chaldees, called by God to go and settle in Canaan. Have you ever sat down to ask yourself, how far was that journey? But before you do that, just remember, there were no flights, there were no cars at the time, but Abram had to leave Ur, his homeland, in Mesopotamia to go and settle in a new place known as Canaan. Do you know how far that was? I was just checking the other day. It's actually 5,570 kilometers. That's the kind of journey it took. Think of it. What did it involve? In those days, he couldn't fly. He couldn't drive. So he most likely walked from Ur to Canaan. 5,500 kilometers. The closest I could get in our modern time like driving from Pulukwane in South Africa all the way up to the Central African Republic, just next to Cameroon, just near Cameroon, near, near Nigeria, that side. And that takes about 88 hours if you're driving. Now imagine someone walking 5,570 kilometers. And if you look at the map of the area, there's a map there. If you look at that, that place, you have that little green line that I've put there on your map. That was the area that Abram had to travel over. That little green line. 
5,570 kilometers. If you remember from the previous session, we looked at the kind of background and the geography of the area. There were mountains, the rocks in the area, the deserts, the rivers, the, the, the fertile area, fertile crescent of the Tigris and the Euphrates River. You're not talking about streams, you're talking about big rivers. He had to cross those. And if you look at the story in the Bible, he didn't travel alone. He had a whole entourage with him. And he had to travel through this earth. Think of it. What kind of terrain did he go through? What did it take to travel such a long trip on foot? Let's look at another one. Tell me, who was Shalmaneser? I'm sure you've read about King Ahab of Israel with his wife Jezebel. And you've read about Ben-Hadad of Syria in the books of Kings. And these two gentlemen, King Ahab and Ben-Hadad, were always fighting each other over a place called Ramoth Gilead. But who was Salmaneser? A guy, who was he? That King Ahab and Ben Haddad had to put their differences aside and join an alliance of 11 nations, 11 kings, to go and fight against this guy called Shalmaneser. Who was he? We are told in history that Ahab contributed 200 chariots and 10,000 soldiers to this alliance. Now imagine what the others contributed, the others from the other 10, 11 nations. What did they contribute? All of them coming against this one guy called Shalmaneser. Who was he? Why did they really want to go and fight him? So it's important for us to understand the Old Testament. Let's just ask ourselves, why do we need to understand the Old Testament? Why is it important for us to understand the world of the Old Testament? Because there are certain practices and things you're going to find in that world that if you don't understand those things, you will not be able to understand what the text is talking about. Let's look at some examples. You all know the story. God spoke to Abram and promised him that he was going to be the father of many nations. And God promised Abram he was going to have a heir through his wife, Sarah. And through that line, God was going to bless the nations, through Abram and his descendants. Ten years after the promise was given by God to make Abram the father of many nations, Abram and Sarah were still childless. They didn't have any children at all. They didn't even have the hair that God had promised them. So in Genesis 16, you read the story of Sarah proposing to Abraham that maybe Abraham should consider sleeping with Hagar, the handmaiden, the maid, and maybe through Hagar, Abram and Sarah could have the promised son. I know you're shaking your head. I can see you wondering how in the world could that woman say such a thing. Because such things are not very common in our modern world. But if you understand that practice in the, in, the, in, the, in the light of the ancient Near East culture, surrogate mothers were common in that, in that time to help par couples who could not have children. 
childless couple. It was common practice in the, in, in the time, but not very common in our time. We don't appreciate that kind of a culture in our age. But in the time, it was common practice. So you look at that account of Sarah making such, such a suggestion. Don't judge her. Just understand it was part of the culture of the day. Another example. In 1 Kings 17, we read the story of Elijah who goes to King Ahab and he declares before King Ahab and says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years, but according to my word. Wow. Abraham, um, Elijah says, to King Ahab, this will only happen according to my word. There will be no rain or dew in the land except according to my word. How can Elijah make such a pronouncement and claim that God lives? How could he? Ask yourself, did Elijah not realize that by withholding rain to a people who depended on agriculture, there would be untold suffering for them, for multitudes. What was Elijah thinking when he did this? We all know the story. There was no rain for many years until Elijah prayed for rain to come and it came. What exactly was happening in that, in, in that incident? Elijah's pronouncement that there would be no dew nor rain was a direct attack on the pagan god, Baal, that was being worshipped by King Ahab, his wife Jezebel, and many of the people of the land. They even had their own prophets, the prophets of Baal. You find them in the book of First Kings 18. It was a whole religion. So Elijah's pronouncement was actually an attack on the pagan god Baal. Baal was a god of storms, lightning, rain, fire, fertility. All these things were what Baal was famous for, according to his worshippers. So when Elijah made the pronouncement, Elijah was direct, God was directly, through Elijah, challenging Baal. The God that Ahab, his wife Jezebel, many people were worshipping at the time. When you come to 1 Kings 18 and read the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where he was even mocking them, it's God, through Elijah, communicating a message to the people. We all know the story. The prophets of Baal danced and cut themselves up and screamed and wailed and, oh, you can imagine all the things that they did. But still, Baal failed to consume the offering from his worshippers. They cut themselves, they had their blood spilling into the place of the sacrifice. But still, Burr could not answer. What happened? It was God once again declaring that he controls the elements. It's not Burr, it's God. Because when Elijah rebuilt the altar, set up the sacrifice, dug the trenches, soaked the sacrifice in water, he just made one prayer. Let it be known today that you alone are God. And the Bible says fire 
came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, licked up the water, bent the stones. God declaring, he alone controls the elements, not man-made gods. Let's continue. Look at some examples. In the book of Amos, chapter 5, you find the prophet Amos accusing his fellow Israelites of depriving the poor of justice at the city gates. And he challenged them to establish and promote justice at the city gate. How can a city gate be a place of justice or injustice? I'm sure many of us have got gates at our houses, our places of residence. The gate is not a place of justice or injustice. It's a place where we enter in and go out. What exactly does that mean? In the time when this was written, the elders of the city had a place by the city gate. That's where they adjudicated. They did justice or injustice at the city gate. Imagine, you're living in the times of the Bible. And while you're sitting there, relaxed, you suddenly see a man running towards you with his clothes torn and he has dirt on his head. A lot of sand on his head. There's an, just an example in the book of First Samuel chapter 4 and verse 12. What would be your first thought and reaction? You think probably the man is insane, is mad, is walking, is running around with torn clothes, is got is dirty. But that was the practice in the land. It was an, a cultural practice. When something did not go the way it was supposed to go, or when people sinned against God, or when if you look at the book of Ezra. When Ezra found out that the Israelites had broken God's word and went and married heathen women, the Bible says Ezra tore his clothes and he sat down and shook his head. It was a practice at the time. But we don't do that in our times. So if we're going to be able to understand the Old Testament, we've got to be able to understand these are the practices that were existing in the time. We said at the beginning that the Old Testament is historical. There's a lot of history associated with the books of the Old Testament and the land of the Old Testament, the whole ancient Near East. Even the coming of Christ was at a predetermined period in human history. Galatians 4, Paul says, when the time was right, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. When the time was right. So there was a predetermined time, the right time, when Jesus was supposed to come. We already saw the location of that. Some of the challenges we find in history is that people think the ancient people could not write so that they could not be able to leave behind documents. But if you look at uh, history, you find that they actually did write. They may not have written the way we write, but they are their own form of writing. They preserved most of their writings on, tab on clay tablets. And we find a lot of that, those texts, a lot of them exist in the British Library. Actually, the British Library has a whole lot of flows just with ancient writings on tablets of clay in cuneiform. They exist. Others preserved their writings on um, 
cylinders, metal cylinders, others on large stones where documents were engraved. I'll give you an example. We have, or rather, archaeologists have unearthed a stone piece known as a detailed down inscription or detailed down stili. The Tel Dan Stili was discovered in 1993 and 1994 at a site in the land of Dan, in the area of Dan, in northern Israel. The excavation was led by Israeli archaeologist Avraham Beran. When those stones were found and they began to put them together to try and connect where each piece links up and connects, they found that that was actually an inscription from one of the kings of the region, the Aramean king, who wrote and said he had overcome his two southern neighbors, the king of Israel and the king of the house of David. Although the inscription doesn't specify exactly which names or which kings were overcome, many scholars believe it, it was Joram, Jehoram of Egypt, of Israel, and Ahaziah of Judah, being overcome by Azaziel, Azael of Damascus. Now, why is this tell done stili or tell done inscription important? It's the first record outside the Bible that mentions David. David, King David, has been one of the kings that has been attacked by non-believing scholars, mainline scholars, for many years. Some of them even went to the point of saying that King David is like King Arthur, the mythological character that we read about in most of our comics or see on the move in the movies, King Arthur of Excalibur. People are saying that that's how David is, a created myth of biblical authors. But when this Tel Dan Shtiri was unearthed, and they could be able, after deciphering the writing, they found the house of David. David being mentioned. Proof. The biblical account has been right all along. There are many others. You have another um, stone structure known as the Mesha steel or the Moabite stone. That also, according to some scholars, makes mention of the house of David. Stone structure done by Mesha, the Moabite king. Some recent studies, some scholars are saying, no, it shouldn't, it, it, it should not read David, but rather it's a story of Balak, the one who hired Balaam to curse the people of God. Well, whoever it was, whether it's David or Balaam, it still tells me the scripture record was true from the very beginning. So look at this world of the Old Testament. It's a real world. It has a geography. It has a history. It has a culture. There are people that lived in that area. There are people that lived during that time. It was not something done in a vacuum. Now we said at the beginning, the Old Testament was given by God to the Jewish people. So through them, we can be able to affect them as a nation and as a people and everybody surrounding the area. So the world of the Old Testament was a real world. We can study about the people that were found in that area, the kingdoms that existed in that area, the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo Persian kingdom, the Hittite kingdom, the Assyrian kingdom. We know about King Nebuchadnezzar, we know about the Akkadian kingdom and King Sargon. And most of these are actually mentioned directly in Scripture. 
So if we are going to be able to understand our study of the Old Testament, we need to take time and read about the world of the Old Testament. Have an understanding of that world, where it is located. Understand the real people, real societies, real cultures, they are their religions. And then Israel, God's chosen people, comes come into this world with a different religion. They believe in one God. This is called monotheism. One God. And that was in contradiction to all the regions where they believed in many gods. So as we close today, I want to encourage you. Take some time. Read up about the world of the Old Testament. Go and read some publication in the archaeology, archaeology that has been unearthed. Read about the kingdoms that existed. Take some time to read about the religions of those areas and the people groups that were there. The Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Kassites, the Mitannis, the Parthians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, Edomites, the Elamites, the Arameans. All those are various people groups that existed in the region. And Israel, the people of God, found themselves in that area. And the Old Testament has expression in that area. God bless you. Thank you for attending our class today. We'll continue again as we build on our study of the Old Testament. We'll see you again in the next class. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, please drop those in the comment section on YouTube or comment on Facebook. God bless you. Amen. Thank you.